Hello and welcome to this GCSE chemistry video about the history of the periodic table. In this short video we're going to take a look at a timeline of how our ideas about the periodic table have changed in the last, well, several thousand years. And then we're going to move on to take a look at the three most important scientists considered during GCSE chemistry. We're going to look at Doberiner and his triads, Newlands and his law of octaves, and Mendeleev and his periodic table that apparently came to him in a dream. I want to take a look first at an overview of how our ideas have changed over time as we've gathered more evidence. So first up, the ancient Greeks were the first people who kind of floated the idea of elements existing. But what they thought of as elements were quite different to what we think of now. They called their elements earth, air, fire and water. And all the substances in the world were made up of combinations of these four elements in varying amounts. These ideas persisted for a very, very long time, nearly 2,000 years, until the time of a chemist called Robert Boyle. Now, Robert Boyle is considered to be the first modern chemist. A definition of what elements were, he decided that elements were substances that could not be broken down. And that was really the first idea since the ancient Greeks. After Boyle, the next notable scientist is a French scientist called Antoine Lavoisier. And in about 1789, he made one of the first recorded efforts to group elements into specific categories. So he had the acid making elements, the gas making elements, metal elements and earth elements. Lavoisier's work was revolutionary for a number of reasons, but it was also flawed because a lot of the things that he was classifying as elements, in fact, weren't elements. They were actually compounds. Next was a scientist called John Dalton. And in 1803, he came up with the idea that elements are made up of indivisible atoms and that atoms of different elements have different masses. That should ring a bell from your atomic structure work. Next comes a Swedish chemist called Baron Johns Jacob Berzelius, and he built on the work of the previous three scientists, and he started listing the atomic weights of the different elements and giving each element a different letter, which we would later come to know them as symbols, but they were very different back then. Not long after Berzelius, came a German scientist called Johann Wolfgang Doberiner. And in his work, which we'll explore more in a moment, he looked at grouping elements into threes. And each of those elements in that three, which he called a triad, had similar chemical properties. After that, the evolution of the periodic table became a little bit more organised and a little bit more collaborative. In 1860, there was a big meeting at a conference in Germany where the atomic weights of the 60 known elements at the time were drawn up in a more accurate list. Not long after that, a scientist called Lothar Mayer noted that if you arrange each element in order of their atomic weight, they fall into groups of similar chemical and physical properties repeated at periodic intervals. And as we saw in the first periodic table video, third period and periodicity means repeating at regular intervals. And round about the same time, a scientist called John Newlands came up with his law of octaves, which was quite similar to the work of Lothar Mayer. And it had groups of elements by atomic weight and repeating patterns of physical properties. Then in 1869 came the work of the famous Mendeleev, whose work we'll explore in a few minutes. His periodic table was really similar to the periodic table that we use now, although there were some missing elements, of course, because they hadn't all been discovered at this time. It wasn't until 25 years later that a scientist called William Ramsey discovered a new group of elements, and they were the noble gases. And then it's only in the last hundred years or so that we've really discovered even more about atoms. We've been discovering the subatomic particles. So electrons were discovered 
1897 by J.J. Thompson. And then in 1913, Rutherford, with his gold leaf alpha particle scattering experiments, he discovered the nucleus. And then in 1932, James Chadwick discovered neutrons. And the discovery of these subatomic particles, particularly the neutron, which led to our discovery about isotopes, these developments gave us enough evidence to reshape Mendeleev's periodic table in subtle minor ways that lead to the modern periodic table as we use it today. We're going to take a look now at three scientists whose work is considered to be particularly important in the development of the modern periodic table. And the first one that I've drawn a little picture of here is Johann Wolfgang Dobereiner. Now, he came up with the of triads. And what Dobereiner did in his triads is he grouped elements into threes. That's what a triad is, a group of three. And each of these elements had similar properties, both their chemical properties and their physical properties. What he also did was he used the relative atomic mass, or as they called it, the atomic weight. Now, these two bits of information, the properties and the atomic weights, they were really the only different bits of information that they had at this time in order to judge the elements. And so that's why such a lot of emphasis was placed on them. Now, what Dobreiner did that works particularly nicely for the elements is he took the elements in their threes. So, for instance, lithium and sodium and potassium, and he took the atomic weights of the lightest of the three, so lithium's atomic weight is seven, and then the heaviest of the three, which is potassium, at 39, and he added those two numbers together, and we get 46. And then when we divide that number by two, we get 23. And the clever thing about Dobereiner's triads is that lithium does indeed have an atomic weight of 23. And so it seemed like a, a worthy member of this triad. In a similar way, if we just look at one other, we can use calcium, which has got an atomic weight of 40, and barium, which has got an atomic weight of 137. And then when we add those two numbers together, we get 177. And when we divide that by two, we get 88.5. And that's why... Dobreiner put strontium in with calcium and barium because strontium's atomic weight is 88. Now this worked quite well because you'll probably know that lithium and sodium and potassium are in fact in the same group to this day and they have very similar chemical properties. Calcium, strontium and barium, they work really well too. But unfortunately this only works for very few of the elements and so Dobereiner's triads couldn't be a foolproof method of organising every single element in the periodic table. But it was an important stepping stone along the way to some of the later scientists. We're going to move on to have a look at the work of John Newlands now. And here is John Newlands, exactly how he looked in 1865. Now, John Newlands arranged the elements in order of increasing atomic mass. And you can see this as you work down his groups. You start with hydrogen, then lithium, etc., working your way down. And so that's how you'd read Newland's periodic table. You start and you work downwards, then you move on to the top of this one, and you work downwards onto the top of this one, and work downwards, etc., moving on through there. And not only did he use increasing atomic weight or mass, as we call it now, he also saw repeating patterns. And repeating patterns are at the very heart of the periodic table's design. And what Newland saw in his periodic table is if you start at an element, and I'm going to start at hydrogen, what he said was that every eighth element would have similar properties to the one that came before it. And so hydrogen is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we get to fluorine count on seven more from fluorine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we'll arrive at chlorine. And we should know that chlorine and fluorine, they are in the same group. Let's start at lithium. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then if we start again at sodium, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
And he called this the law of octaves because an octave is a series of eight notes with regular intervals between each note of the same letter. And that was what Newlands thought for his periodic table, that we would have similar elements that were spaced at a sequence of every eight. Newland's periodic table was very, very good for a number of reasons, but there were definitely some flaws. First and foremost, if we have a look here, we've got a lot of situations where we've got two elements in the same space in a group. And so that doesn't sit right with what we know about the modern periodic table. We can't have two elements being the same elements. Not only that, but we have lots of instances where we've got metals, like iron, in the same group of the periodic table as non-metals, like chlorine. And this happens in the next group as well. Fluorine, non-metal. Magnesium, metal. Aluminium, metal. Silicon, non-metal. In fact, this happens in many of Newland's groups. So those were the big two downsides. Two elements in the same space in the periodic table, and metals and non-metals in the same group. And so Newlands was heavily criticised by other scientists for these reasons, particularly grouping the elements together with elements that were really, really different to each other. For instance, these gases and these metals. The final scientist we're going to look at in this video is Dmitry Mendeleev, or sometimes pronounced Mendeleev. Now, this is him in 1869, just after he's had one of the most famous dreams in chemistry. It had been a great puzzle to Mendeleev about how to organise the elements. It took a great deal of his time and his energy, but eventually he was able to put the elements mainly into order of atomic mass, but he did switch a few of these elements round if the properties didn't quite fit. An example of this can be seen if we have a look at tellurium and iodine. Now iodine actually has a smaller relative atomic mass than tellurium, but he placed it after tellurium because it has very similar properties to the other elements in the group that we'll now recognise as halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine. But iodine and tellurium didn't quite fit the pattern in terms of increasing atomic mass because iodine was actually lighter. Now, I mentioned that this idea came to Mendeleev in a dream, and the thing that had been causing him the greatest amount of trouble was that if you organise the elements by increasing atomic weight, it only made sense if you left gaps. And this is really taken to be Mendeleev's most radical idea. And so what he did was he left gaps to indicate what he thought of as undiscovered elements. And that's what these little stars are representing here. These are the gaps in the periodic table where Mendeleev thought that new elements would eventually be discovered. But other than these gaps, the periodic table that Mendeleev created was really, really similar to the one that we know today. If you just take a look at group one, you can see almost all of the elements that we know today. We're just missing francium at the bottom. And so Mendeleev's periodic table is really, really similar, other than the fact that he left gaps for undiscovered elements. These gaps are really the, one of the main reasons how we know Mendeleev was right. If we take a look at one of his gaps, probably his most famous gap, where he predicted that the element beneath silicon in the periodic table, which he called eka silicon, and by that he meant the next one in the pattern, and he made predictions about what eka silicon would be like. He said it would be a grey metal with an atomic mass of 72 and a high melting point. He went so far as to predict that the density would be 5.5 grams per cubic centimetre and that the oxides formula would be eka silicon, the element, 1 to 2 oxygen. So he predicted the ratio would be 1 of the element to 2 of the oxygen. And when we discovered germanium in 1886. It was indeed a grey metal. Its atomic mass was 73, rather than 72, but very, very similar. 
The melting point was 947, which we can all agree is a very high temperature. The density was 5.4 grams per centimetre cubed, which I think we can forgive that 0 0.1. And the formation of the oxide was in the ratio 1 to 2, exactly how he predicted germanium oxide on there. And so an element was discovered that was staggeringly close to the predictions made by Mendeleev. And then, in the early 20th century, the discovery of isotopes confirmed that Mendeleev was correct not to place elements in a strict order of atomic mass, but it was necessary to account for their chemical and physical properties like he did. And the reason for this is that isotopes of the same element have got different atomic masses, but the exact chemical properties, so they occupy the same position in the periodic table. And remember, the isotopes, they've got different masses, but because they've got the same protons, same atomic number that means, they've therefore got the same electrons as well. And it's a consequence of having the same electrons that means they will have the same chemical properties, because it's the electrons that influence the chemical properties. So to finish off this video with just a very quick summary about the work of Newlands compared to the work of Mendeleev, both of them ordered their periodic table by order of increasing atomic weight, although Mendeleev did a little bit of reorganising of some of the elements where they fitted better. Both of them included all of the known elements in their periodic table, although Mendeleev left gaps for elements that had not yet been discovered. For Newlands, he declared that every eighth element in his periodic table had similar chemical properties, whereas Mendeleev, he grouped his elements together into whole groups of elements with similar properties. Newlands was criticised widely by other scientists for grouping elements together that they were very different to. Mendeleev and his leaving of gaps, that was viewed as a curiosity at first, but when his predictions were proven later, it was widely accepted very, very quickly indeed. I should finish by saying, as a reminder, that the one group in the periodic table that Mendeleev had no information about, and so couldn't predict their existence, was the noble gases. And, as we'll see in a later video, this is because the noble gases are very, very unreactive, and so therefore very, very hard to detect. Right. That's the end of this video. I hope it was useful. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.